Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On Wednesday this week, there were a couple of NASA press conferences which were both a bit of a downer. One was about you know, discussing the deorbiting of the International Space Station, but more immediately, the second one was about the cancellation of the Viper rover, a rover which has just finished construction and will now not be flying to the moon because of the way budgetary laws kick in. So Viper is the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. It's being built uh, just down the road from me at NASA Ames. It was a 430 kilogram design, designed to go to the South Pole. It had a drill, it would drill into the surface. It had a spectrometer to analyze and find ice. And it would be delivered on the Griffin lander built by Astrobotic as part of the CLIPS program, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. And the weirdest and most bizarre thing about this is because of the way CLIPS is funded, NASA has already paid for the lander and the payload. And since the rover is being cancelled, they have to send something else. They will be sending a mass simulator rather than the rover, which has just been finished building, right? This is one of the most bizarre bits of news. And I'm sure, you know, like the China space fans out there are just going to be laughing at this because China's landed a couple of rovers. India space, they're going to be laughing. They just landed their rover. But no, and NASA is going to take the rover that it has just built and disassemble it and instead fly a chunk of mass, you know, chunk of block of something instead. Maybe they'll send like a big, you know, pizza to the moon or something just to show that this commercial lander works. So look, the reason why this is getting cancelled is because back in 2005, uh, NASA, there was a law written that basically says if NASA, any NASA project exceeds 30% over its initial budget, then NASA on its own is not allowed to proceed with the project. From that point, the only money they can spend is money to shut the project down. Now, they can go to Congress and they can get uh, politicians to say, well, we think, you know, put some money in or whatever to ch rewrite the law to allow them to proceed with this project. But I'm not sure I'm going to see that happen. It's an election year. I'm not sure uh, there are politicians that want to risk this because putting stuff like this on a commercial service was seen as pretty risky. Um, but yeah, look, why is it 30% over budget? Well, a big part of this is because, well, you've got all the usual stuff, you know, you have issues with construction that needs sorted. They had a lot of delays in getting things delivered. That was partly because of the supply issues related to the pandemic. There was a little bit of inflation in there, but also as they got through the design process, they got a little cagey about this Griffin lander and asked Astrobotic to do some more testing. So that added $50 million to their budget. I think the original budget was $450 million or thereabouts. And the, by the time they're done, it would be more than this. The uh, also th then the rover, sorry, then the lander got delayed. So it was potentially going to launch at the end of this year. Now it's not, and that's going to add a whole other year. And that means a whole year that you have to keep all the key project staff on hand. You have to keep the spares around. You have to give people something to do. So they are being pay they're paying extra for this, and that extra year is enough to push them over their prospective budget. And so the whole project goes off to Congress. And yeah, one of the most frustrating things about this is that I can see why uh, politicians might pass this 30% cap, you know, to provide some incentive, right, a stick to keep missions in line and stop them uh, expanding over the resources by huge amounts unchecked. But the problem is when the CLIPS contracts were written by, you know, back in 2020, they clearly didn't include any enough penalties for the likes of Astrobotic, who have been able to go way over schedule and therefore are, are the ones that are causing the mission itself to get cancelled. And they're not the ones getting punished because they are still getting paid. They're just not flying anything that they could lose in an embarrassing fashion. And so it's bizarre that over the last few years, we have seen lots of people try to land stuff on the surface of, and fail because of software, because of code issues. Chandrayaan 2, Bereshit, Luna 25, Hakuto R all failed because of problems with their computer code. But Viper is going to fail because of problems with legal code. How about that for innovation in America? 
Now, look, it's not guaranteed at this point that this is going to shut down. Sure, there's a chance that Congress does something. There is also, uh, like, NASA is looking for potential partners who might want to do something with the rover before they start disassembling it and putting the parts into other rovers. It's entirely possible that some university says, well, this is only going to cost us $20 million and then we can, you know, put our name on there and get exclusive access to the science and stuff. That may or may not happen. Maybe Jeff Bezos, he's big on the moon. Why, is, why doesn't Jeff come along with his very deep pockets? So anyway, look, let, let's just talk about Viper in general. I actually got to sit in on one of the live build streams at NASA. It was very interesting to talk about it with the, the developers and the designers of this. So the lunar south poles are, or the lunar poles are interesting because they don't get nearly as much sunlight and because uh, various satellites like Lunar Prospector uh, and Lady have found evidence that there is water trapped at the lunar poles, but we're not quite sure where it is. So we wanted to send a rover down there and actually dig into the surface and see whether there was enough water, that, if, whether it was in a form that could be easily extracted, because then you can do uh, you know, in situ resource re-extraction, right? Utilization, ISRU is what they call it. And the idea is you can take water out, you know, heat up your soil, it comes off as vapor, and then you maybe crack it into hydrogen and oxygen, and then you have rocket propellant. And it's great because a lot of rocket propellant is spent getting rocket propellant to space. So if you could get it from the moon, suddenly that makes expanding and exploiting and you know, industrializing the solar system vastly easier. Also, of course, humans need water, so it'd be nice to find that on the moon as well. This project, Viper, actually goes back to a previous mission design called a Resource Prospector, which was, I think it started out in like 2015 and it had pretty much the same idea. They would have a drill, they would have a little, little oven and a spectrometer. They built like an example rover, tested it, and they were working towards developing this into a proper mission. And then on April 23rd, 2018, someone at NASA decided to cancel the mission. And what's really interesting about 23rd of April 2018 is that it's the same day that Jim Bridenstine started as the NASA director. So somebody at NASA literally cancelled this mission hours before a new administrator came in who was actually quite interested in doing stuff on the moon and he wasn't in any position to reverse this but he was in a position to, as part of the CLIPS program, move Viper into being and make that part of the CLIPS program. So yeah, essentially Resource Prospector was reborn as Viper and it became part of the CLIPS program. It was moved to NASA Ames and it's worked through all its design, its construction. It is ready to go. The main thing that has to happen to the rover is it needs to go through environmental testing. It needs to uh, go into like vacuum chambers and verify that all the electronics work, you know, run through the different thermal cycles. When you put things in a vacuum, sometimes you'll find the electrical stuff arcs across the gap because as you reduce the pressure, Passion's law basically says that, you know, your resistance of the gas goes, or the, the medium goes down and you can get electrical arcs in places where they shouldn't be, or they wouldn't be in the Earth, uh, in, in the Earth's atmosphere. So because the Viper was designed to operate at the poles with low sun angle, it doesn't look like other rovers. It's a big box and the sides of the box have the solar panels, right? Because it has to stick up high. The antenna sticks up a whole lot higher. The panels have to stick up higher rather than sitting flat on the top. And that makes the rover look big and boxy. But actually most of that space above the top, uh, you know, the top half is empty. It's just your know, structure to carry those solar panels. The rover is still actually kind of low center of mass with all the drive and the power systems close to the ground. The middle of the rover does have this big long drill that needs to you know, go vertically. So that is actually part of the structure. In addition to the drill, the other instruments it had was like a neutron spectrometer, infrared spectrometer, a mass spectrometer, all this stuff would be used to analyze the stuff that was brought out from the surface of the moon. Now, uh, it was interesting that when they looked at the resource prospector, it had like an oven that they could use to heat up the material and look at the gases coming off. They didn't do that in this case. They just said, well, let's extract the stuff with a drill, dump it into a pile, 
and then move the rover around so that its instruments can actually look at this pile of stuff that we've just pulled out from underneath the surface, rather than having a specific you know, section of the, the um, rover that would actually contain and analyze this stuff. And that would be not as good, but it would be more than adequate to actually make some amazing discoveries, I'm sure. See, one of the really cool things about Viper was that because it was going to the South Pole, its operations were going to be very different from other rovers. So at the pole, the sun doesn't get very high above the horizon and it doesn't get very low above the horizon. But the way the shadows move are like the way shadows move close to sunset. You know, you will see the shadows get very long. You will find areas where it's hidden, where you know the sun is blocked and you'll have areas that remain in sunlight longer. The mission plan had to really take this into account. They had designed traverses where they would go from one light area to another area and they would have to cross this time, this distance, in the time when the sun was high enough above the horizon and then they would reach a safe spot while the sun starts to get low. For like you know, about half the year, this the moon's poles are illuminated by the sun and then for six months they're not illuminated by the sun. So Viper could only operate for a limited amount of time and even then it had to be very careful moving through these spaces. And you know there would be times when it would have the opportunity to descend into a permanently shadowed region with headlamps. It was the first rover actually designed with its own lighting so that it could actually investigate some of these regions. Because of this, because of this six month cycle, it could only really launch towards the end of 2024 and then a year later in 2025. If it launched too late, once it got to the moon, the sun would be going down and it wouldn't have enough time for this. So any delay pushed it back. And honestly, when I heard that Griffin was going to be delayed, I was actually quite happy with that because I felt that the Clips program, while it has great potential, Right now, it's a bit of a mess. You know, we've had Astrobotics Peregrine fail. We had uh, Intuitive Machines Odyssey barely get to the moon after this problem with the ground checklist. And honestly, the commercial people may want to act like they're the future of spaceflight, but they have to step up and actually start doing it. And, and unfortunately, this just makes Clip's program look even worse. And it could be that, look, this cancellation is part of like some internal policy at NASA. There are people at NASA that still want to handle all these landers. They argue that they should be the ones doing this, not some, that we shouldn't be buying it from some outside company. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, if you get this going, then you get the sort of SpaceX effect and suddenly you don't have to worry about these minutia. But there's definitely a lot of people at NASA that want this still to be happening. And they could absolutely be ones that are responsible for this in as a political move rather than a operational or scientific move. They are following the letter of the law. They're not moving funds in the way that agencies move funds around. But maybe, I don't know enough about internal NASA funding, right? This thing could be complicated in ways that I don't understand, right? There's all sorts of magic that happens when you're administrating funds that uh, it's not rocket science and frankly, I'm not sure what NASA's doing if it's not rocket science. So now what happens if Viper isn't saved? Well, the, it's going to be disassembled. The instruments are going to be made available to other projects. And one possible project that would make sense would be the Endurance Rover, which is more or less Viper, but instead of using solar power, it uses nuclear power. And that means that it could operate for much longer. It could operate essentially year round. Now, it might have issues with thermals at night and it would also need a relay satellite because for a significant part of the time, Earth is very low on the horizon and unavailable. But yeah, that is a possibility and it might make more sense. But I think that you would be talking a fairly significant delay during which, of course, uh, it's highly likely that the human landing system, Artemis 3, gets to the moon before the rovers and then, you know, they've got to do a whole bunch of stuff that the rovers would normally be doing. So it's not really, I, I strongly think that Viper should get to the moon before the current Artemis stuff. But the problem, of course, is that, yeah, you require someone at Congress to actually look at this and say, well, we spent all this money on this thing and we're going to spend another bunch of money to send a block of metal to the moon. 
why don't we just put the rover on there? Oh yeah, this law says, well, screw that law, I'm a lawyer, right? You know, that's the kind of person, someone with imagination, that's able to like see the sensible thing and also see that, yeah, other countries are essentially going to laugh at this if NASA shuts this down under this circumstances. Yeah, space politics sometimes makes me, uh, makes me angry. <laughs> Uh, but yes, uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that we see something going. I, I'm hoping that the Clips program actually starts producing some real results soon because otherwise uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not looking that great. Okay, so once again, let's summarize things. Viper was supposed to go to the moon at the end of this year because of delays and other stuff. It is not going. Moreover, it's possibly going to get disassembled and the lander is going to land without the rover. It's going to land with a block of stuff instead. The only way to save it is for someone at Congress to actually go in and authorize this, right? To authorize spending just a little bit more money to actually get it to the moon or for a private company or individual or university to come along and put up some part of the funding to keep this project below the 30% cap, or it's potentially getting disassembled and flown to the moon, the, the instruments may get flown to the moon in future missions, which are likely to get there long after humans have put boots on the moon again, uh, which, you know, it will still be valuable scientifically. It won't be a cool thing in the public's imagination. A lot of people know about Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. They don't know about the two Soviet rovers that moved around the moon for longer than any of the Apollo astronauts ever did. So yeah, look, I'm hoping this gets sorted out in the best way possible. I want to see a win for the US space program. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.